CTO. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. George Xavier Cords and I welcome you back to the channel. So we continue off from where we left off, which is uh, question 48. So the question at hand is, what symptom is most typical for this pathology? So we have a 74-year-old patient that has been delivered to the admissions room with clinical signs of acute deep brain thrombosis. So the clinical feature that is most significant or most related to this disorder is Bowman's sign. Bowman's sign is basically dorsiflexion sign, which means that um, you're bending your, your foot towards your shin. That's what usually produces the pain. And then the other signs that are there in the patient, so Rovsing sign uh, is a sign usually seen in appendicitis. And then Corvasia sign um, is a sign that is seen in gallbladder disorders, which is basically when there's uh, a presence of a palpably enlarged gallbladder, which is non-tender, uh, which is sometimes accompanied by jaundice. Um, that means the cause is uh, unlikely to be due to, to gallstones, but it's in relation to gallbladder disorders. And then Meyer Robson sign is uh, mostly associated with acute pancreatitis. Uh, it is basically a point of the inner two thirds with the external one third of the line, which represents the bisection of the left upper abdominal quadrant where tenderness on pressure exists uh, in pancreatic disease. So you usually see it in, in acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis. And then gray tenor sign uh, is basically bruising of the flanks or part of the body between the rib and your hip. And then this bruising usually appears as a blue discoloration and is a sign of retroperitoneal bleeding or bleeding behind the peritoneum. Moving on. So we have the question, which is, what is the most likely diagnosis? So we have a nine month child who is presenting with, so it's a nine month child who's presenting with fever, cough, and dyspnea. The symptoms appeared five days after she had contact with a person with an upper respiratory tract infection. Objectively, the child is in a grave condition. Temperature is high, 38 degrees. Cyanosis uh, of the nasolabial triangle, which is uh, blueness of the skin, which is seen when you have low um, saturation of oxygen, potentially. And then the respiratory rate is 54. The patient has nasal flaring that is observed. So usually nasal flaring is something you would see if someone is in grave respiratory distress. So there was a percussion downness in the right below the scapular angle. So percussion downness on the right below the scapular angle. Um, and then auscultation reviewed bilateral fine most moist crackles. Uh, predominate, predominantly on the right. Um, so the correct answer is pneumonia. These are typical findings for, for pneumonia that, yet, that you would expect to see in the disorder. Basically the presence of your cough as well as your fever, your, your dyspnea, so it's a dry cough, and the physical findings, especially of a percussion note that is dull in the right area, followed by having moist crackles predominantly in the right side. So for the other options, which include other respiratory tract infections, they usually don't produce um, the downness to percussion or moist rows because with the moist rows, the reason why you're having those is due to the uh, inflammatory exudate that would have been building up in your, in your lungs. That's why you're having the downness to percussion. And then uh, for acute laryngotracheitis, um, it usually present, it presents in young children as well, but it has a barking cough and stridor and uh, it not primarily described to, to have like uh, lung findings, not really, you wouldn't expect to have lung findings for that one. Uh, and then acute bronchitis um, is a disorder that usually affects the, the bronchus. Yes, inflammation of the bronchus, you might potentially have cough. But really, do you have any uh, consolidation of the lungs, which is specific for pneumonia? And then acute bronchiolitis uh, also affects infants. 
characterized by difficulty in breathing and sometimes wheezing. Um, but you don't really have uh, consolidation of the lung as you would expect in pneumonia. All right, so moving on to the next question, which is question 50. So question at hand is what, what diagnosis was most likely to be stated in the referral? So we have a mother of a three month child who came to a family doctor with complaints of a child being physically underdeveloped. So the three month child complaining of physical underdevelopment and suffering from cough attacks as well as dyspnea. So in the anamnesis, which is the history, uh, the child is a result of a second term, second full term pregnancy with risk of miscarriage. So the first child died of of pulmonary pathology at the age of four months, got a mother. Body mass is 2.5 grams, of 2,500 grams, which is fairly on the lower spectrum, so that's low weight. The cough attacks have been observed from the first days of life, so cough attacks being observed from the first days of life. Twice the child was treated for bronchitis. So twice the child was treated for bronchitis. Um, considering the severity of the child's condition, the doctor made a refer to hospital, made the referral for hospitalization. So, from this, um, this is a classic case of cystic fibrosis, mainly because the child is presenting with a lot of cough attacks, and is also underdeveloped for someone who's three months of age, um, and the patient has also had a history of being infected twice by, by bronchitis. And the mother mentioned um, a history of having a child uh, who died of a pulmonary pathology, uh, which could also point towards cystic fibrosis because it's a inheritable disorder. So cystic fibrosis is uh, a little bit more about the disorder. It's um, autosomal recessive. So it's caused by the presence of mutations in both your copies um, of your CFTR protein gene, uh, and those single working copy uh, carriers and otherwise mostly normal. But when you have problems with the with the gene or when you have cystic fibrosis, uh, it affects the way you produce your sweat, digestive fluids, um, as well as mucous membranes. So this is why they usually do a sweat test and sometimes genetic test. Uh, usually screening is done uh, in some places, in some other countries. Uh, I'm not really sure about the screening schedule in Ukraine, but it should be done in Ukraine as well. Uh, so because of the problems with the production of sweats and digestive fluid, uh, as well as mucus, so they usually have beak secretions, which is why they usually end up having cough. Um, and then they also have salty tasting skin, poor growth, and poor weight despite having normal intake of food because remember you have your problems with digestive uh, enzymes as well so you're not going to be or the child is not going to be able to, to digest uh, the food very well that's why not gaining much weight so that because of the mucus buildup they're mostly prone to having a lot of respiratory infections which is why we, we saw that this child had um, acute bronchitis already twice uh, at a young age um, I guess, um, yeah, I guess uh, it's, it's a single gene disorder. Yep, I guess that's, that's all I can remember for now. Uh, and then for the other ones, so acute obstructive bronchitis um, typically doesn't have a family history to it. And usually there might have been previous contact with someone who was, um, who was infected, but not like a heritable disorder. And doesn't usually end up having a chronic symptoms. Uh, if we're looking at children that have developed disorder. And then recurrent obstructive um, bronchitis, although it's recurrent and has respiratory features, um, it also doesn't have a genetic history. So the main thing that was, I think, that will be able to point you towards cystic fibrosis is that the first child died of a pulmonary pathology, which would point towards genetic disorder. And then pertussis, um, 
usually has severe coughing fits uh, and also doesn't match the history, the family history that we had. And then acute pneumonia is um, similar to the explanation that we I gave you in the previous question, so it doesn't match with this with this diagnosis. So we move on to question 51. So question 51 is asking, what is the most likely complication that the patient is having? So you have a 46-year-old man who tells you that he has swollen legs, weakness, and sensation of fullness and heaviness in the right subcostal area. So it is the first occurrence of these signs in the patient. The patient has a 20-year-long history of rheumatoid arthritis. The liver, the spleen are enlarged and dense, so enlargement of the liver, so there's splenomegaly. Uh, blood creatinine is 0 0.23 millimoles, proteinemia of 68 grams, cholesterol of 4.2, um, urine specific gravity of 1,012, and then protein urea of 3.3. Um, and then isolated waxy cylinders, leached erythrocytes uh, on vision, and then leukocytes. Uh, five to six within the visual field. So because of the so the, the options we have uh, re renal amyloidosis. So because of the patient's presenting signs of leg swelling, weakness, um, sensation of heaviness, um, and the different findings as well as protein urea, uh, especially protein urea. These are pointing towards uh, nephrotic syndrome, and then you would also align it with amyloidosis because when you have a long-standing inflammatory disorder such as rheumatoid arthritis, you are more prone to developing um, amyloidosis, which is basically a deposition of protein within the different organs. And then you also have enlargement of these other organs as well. So a little bit about um, secondary amyloidosis. So basically there's an extracellular deposit um, of protein in your organs, which we have seen, and then it's secondary or occurs mostly due to uh, in chronic inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it can be chronic infections as well, or inflammatory bowel disease, malignancy, also very common with malignancy as well. And then the presentation can vary, but sometimes patients can present with uh, signs of proteinuria, such as we're seeing in this patient. In some cases, because of the deposition of different organs, you might have heart failure if it's deposited in the organ in the, in the heart, hepatomegaly or hepatosplenomegaly, visible org organ enlargement, such as enlargement of the tongue, known as uh, microglossia, reading disorders, and usually the treatment that is provided is called cochicin, or you try and make sure you treat the underlying condition um, so that you can manage it accordingly. Uh, looking at the other options that were in this question, so with chronic glomerulonephritis, it typically presents with protein urine hematuria, but there is the lacking of the specific context of rheumatoid arthritis of of having a long standing uh, inflammatory disorder. That that is what I would I would say is the is the is the difference in this in this scenario. And then acute glomerulonephritis is going to be ruled out because the way the question is described is um chronic nature of the disorder. That's why you you then rule out um acute glomerulonephritis. And then heart failure. Um usually with heart failure, yes you can get swelling uh of the extremities, but you don't usually get protein urea. That's why that one was ruled out. And then with uh chronic pyelonephritis which usually involves current kidney infections 
um, but it, it also is not really connected uh, to having a long-standing emotional virus. I, I would say, um, for the sake of COP, just try and connect having a long-standing inflammatory disorder to uh, renal amyloidosis and having the presence of uh, protein urea. All right, moving on to the next question. So the question at hand is, what is the most likely diagnosis? So we have a 23-year-old man who's been, who had taken one gram of aspirin to treat an acute respiratory infection. So after that, he ended up developing an asthmatic fit with labored expiration that was stopped by the introduction of amin aminophile. The patient has no medical history of allergies. The patient has undergone two surgeries for nasal polyps. Uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? So the most likely diagnosis is aspirin-induced asthma. So the reason why that's the most likely diagnosis is because the patient developed an asthmatic fit following um, intake of aspirin. That's one. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is that patient has a history of having nasal polyps so if you have a history of nasal polyps aspirin usage and asthma that is known as the um, asthma triad um, asthma triad or symptoms triad and then <clears throat> looking at the other options that are there so at Atopic bronchial asthma is usually triggered by allergens. This is what you'd commonly see in practice. Uh, this is what you'd uh, normally control with uh, beta 2 adrenergic, uh, short acting beta 2 adrenergic agonists or corticosteroids. And then um, infectious allergic bronchial asthma triggered by infections, not really aspirin, exercise induced. Triggered by physical activity, not really. Um, aspirin induced. Um, yeah, so basically, the, the key thing to remember for this question is um, aspirin, nasal polyps, and presence of asthma. So I think this one is e easier. And then, uh, next question is what is the most likely diagnosis? So we have a 50 year old man. Uh, who has been delivered um so it's a 50 year old man oh my apologies so it's a 50 year old man who has been delivered with uh, blood traces in his urine so this is uh bloodless traces in urine so your urination is is painless and undis undis disturbed microhematuria had been observed for three days. Objectively, kidneys cannot be palpated. Suprapubic area is without any alterations. External genitalia shows no pathology. And then on rectal examination, the prostate is not enlarged. Uh, painless and normal structure. Cystoscopy uh, is normal without any alterations. So the reason, the correct answer is renal carcinoma. The reason why one would think of renal carcinoma as an option is because the age of the patient is advanced. So the patient is 50 year old and they are presenting with painless hematuria. So the, the key is an old patient presenting with painless hematuria is most likely renal carcinoma in core questions. Um, I don't know about, I haven't met any patient in practice myself, but um it's it's your first suspicion so in an older patient and you see macro hematuria that is painless your first suspicion is to rule out renal carcinoma and then the other thing is that there are no other alterations that you're finding that would point you to any other disorder so for example with bladder uh, tuberculosis you probably see some sort of alterations on cystoscopy which basically allows you to visualize the, the bladder. Um, same with, so varicose cells um, usually affect uh, the scrotum veins. Um, you'd also be able to palpate those. Uh, a dystopic kidney is usually a congenital disorder that you'd see in, in young 
um, young infants doesn't typically present with the hematuria. Um, and then necrotic papyrus, this one I'm not really sure about, but um, but yeah, the key is remembering that the patient that is of advanced age with macrohematuria is most likely going to be having a renal carcinoma. And then the next question says, what is the disease that we're dealing with? So we have a man who complains of constant dull pain in the perineum and suprapubic area. His weak flow of urine, um, weak flow of urine, frequent, difficult, painful urination, and nocturia. The patient has been suffering from this condition for several months. So there's been, uh, so it's now it's like a chronic, chronic condition. Um, during which urination is becoming increasingly difficult, so the condition is worsening, and then pain in the perineum has developed. On rectal examination, the prostate is enlarged, dense, asymmetrical, and central fissures smoothed out, and the right lobe is of stony, painless tuberous. Stony density, painless, and tuberous. And the correct answer in this case is prostate cancer so the patient is presenting with classic signs of difficult in urination weak painful weak painful flow for several months which are becoming worse and then also the findings of having a physically enlarged prostate uh, are also pointing towards um, cancer unfortunately we don't have the age in this case <coughs> Sorry about that. Unfortunately, we don't have the age in this case, but um, <clears throat> so we don't have the age in this case. But and usually the um patients that are of older age, um, with the other disorders that are that are mentioned in this case. So with um, prostate sclerosis, this one usually involves hardening of the prostate tissues and then. It lacks the specific asymmetrical and tuberous finding that they found in this one. This is more likely to be associated with cancer. And then urolithiasis is usually from presence of a stone. Although you might get painful urination, in some cases you might also get um, blood being present um, in the urine. And then you really um, find enlarged prostate when you have uh, problems that are related to urolithiasis. And then uh, a prostate, a prostate tuberculosis uh, would present with more systemic uh, symptoms because you're dealing with tuberculosis. And then the findings here are more likely targeting towards uh, prostate cancer. And then chronic Congestion prostitis, prostitis is usually present with a tender and swollen prostate, but it's not usually a hard and then doesn't have asymmetrical um, findings, which have been described in this case. All right. Um, okay, I think uh, I'll stop here for today. And then we'll continue the rest of the questions another time. Thank you very much for your attention. Hope you guys enjoyed the videos. Good luck.